Hi. <laughs> Madam President, distinguished guests and graduates, I'd like to thank you very much for this honor. I appreciate the fact that Algonquin College has a proud history of preparing people for a wide range of careers. I take this as recognition of the work that I've done, and I'm very grateful to you for this. I'm a child of radio, and I always loved radio. As a matter of fact, I used to, maybe we're talking a long time ago, early 40s, pretend that I was sick so I could stay home and listen to certain radio programs. Um, in those days, uh, CBC was it, but they had some interesting programming. Um, when I was growing up, TV didn't exist, and of course the internet was not even dreamed of. Radio, newspapers, and magazines were the primary communications media. As a teenager, I had a long-term dream of what I, wanted, what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in music, radio, and entertainment, but that dream at the time seemed remote. At college, I worked at the college radio station both as a DJ or music announcer and as a play-by-play -play sports announcer. DJ today has come to mean something different. In, in those days, we called people who were on radio DJs. Um, as a matter of fact, I have a grandson in Toronto who has been a DJ, and now he uh, promotes and publicizes um, DJs. I went to Clarkson College in Upper New York State. Clarkson had one of the ho top hockey teams in the US. Many of the players came from this region. I traveled all over New England announcing hockey games. They had, in those days, there were no names on jerseys, so, and there was a new team every few days, and I had to memorize on the spot the, uh, the names of the uh, hockey players by their numbers, but it was uh, a good, memory training experience. When I graduated from college, I went to work on my mother's family's business here in Ottawa. We dealt in scrap metals, rags, and paper, as well as new and used auto parts. We also had a gas station, and one of my jobs was pumping gas. It was all a very good experience. At one point, I went to a seminar at Michigan State University uh, it was put on by the Secondary Materials Association. It's interesting how the terminology has evolved. First it was known as junk, then scrap, then went to secondary materials, and now we call it recycling, and it's considered respectable. I can actually remember a few old people bringing in their scrap in horse-drawn wagons. We were located in La Breton Flats, not far from the Shadier Bridge and behind today's War Museum. While I was at the seminar, I became aware of something called a Mac Grab. I was responsible for getting our company to buy one. It had a large grapple and a magnet in the center, and it made our work much more efficient. I learned a lot about um, pre-computer inventory systems and business ethics. I observed how my father and my grandfather did much of their business based on verbal commitment. Keeping your word was not only the right thing to do, but was also very important for building a strong reputation. But as much as I liked working there, my heart was elsewhere. My roommate from college was working for a food wholesaler, and he told me he was looking for a new business opportunity. At the time, there were no standalone record stores in, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, this was the era of, the early uh, era of vinyl records. We called them long plays or LPs. And there were also smaller versions called 45s. And then there were 78s, made mostly of shellac. The numbers, of course, indicated the numbers of rotations per minute around the turntable. This was long before CDs, MP3s, SoundCloud, or WAV files. My wife, Louise, and I had visited some wonderful, large music stores in New York, 
and they offered a wide and diverse selection of records. They also had very knowledgeable salespeople who would specialize in certain types of music. In those days, you had to go to a store to buy music. My par partner Arnold and I decided to open a small version of that type of store in Ottawa. It went very well. Our opening day sales were $365, different value uh, of dollar in those days. One of the clerks said to Louise, you made $365, and Louise told him, you didn't take into consideration your salary, the cost of records, and other expenses, including advertising. It became one of the hot spots for people who came regularly to buy the latest selection of pop, country, classical, folk, or jazz. Later on, uh, we expanded into more stores, also selling audio equipment, sheet music. In the second year, it led to presenting some small live concerts. It was a natural tie-in to the record business. We, we sold tickets at the store, and in those days, the tickets were $250, $350, $4. Very soon, we were able to present big concerts, the Rolling Stones, Beach Boys, Bob Dylan, Johnny Cash, Joni Mitchell, Metallica. I was thinking earlier, being on this stage is unusual for me. I was usually the guy out at the, the back of the audience, except one night on a somewhat um, shorter stage at the old Ottawa Auditorium with the Rolling Stones, 1965 to be exact, I was on the stage helping police prevent enthusiastic young people from coming up on the stage. <laughs> At the same time, we got into artist management with people like Bruce Coburn and, and others. It was all a natural evolution. I should mention that even though uh, there have been successes along the way, like Shea 106 and, and early years of the Treble Clef stores, um, there were failures too, um, and I'm just lucky that um, the successes outweighed the failures. You have to take risks and chances, and you learn from your mistakes. At this time, in the, in the mid-70s, there were few radio stations in Ottawa. Much of the music that we were selling at the stores could not be heard on local radio. With help from, from ex some experienced radio people and some outside investors, in 1976, we applied for and received the license for a new FM station, Shea 106. We went on air in March 1977. It was a very eclectic station. Stations these days tend to be very uh, categorized and sometimes narrow. We played rock, good pop, folk, some jazz, blues, and it also offered some interesting talk. We struggled at first, but within three years, Shea FM was one of Ottawa's leading stations. I give credit for its success to a wonderful, talented, and bright group of people who worked at the station. This was a conscious decision. I'm fortunate that in most of my business situations, I've been supported by staff who are smarter, more talented than me. This success eventually led to getting involved in other stations. To jump ahead for a sec, when the time came to sell Shea FM Inc., I made sure to share the proceeds with the staff who helped create the success, not just the investors. We were the first station to have many women on air in the newsroom, announcers, jocks, in dealing with everybody at every level, I generally believe in being empathetic and open. A few decisions were top down, but it was most important having so many bright and talented people that their ideas should be heard and accepted. I've always wanted to share what I like with others to give people something that I hope they'll enjoy. I would say I've been blessed with curiosity. I believe in asking questions, checking things out. And catalyst is an important word for me in connecting emerging artists with people who can help them. 
The reward may not be monetary, but the, the re reward and the gratification comes from um, sharing in their success. Now that you're graduating, you may not know what you want to do for the rest of your life. Don't worry about that. Just get out there and do something, working in retail or construction, being a barista. It's all good experience. Just do a good job and keep on the lookout for something that ignites you, that really interests you, and something, hopefully, that you're very passionate about. This is still a country that offers a lot of opportunity for people. You've made practical choices by being here at Algonquin, and your dreams are needed out there. Thank you.